Well, good morning, Rehoboth. Hey, welcome to worship this morning. Hi, good morning. I'm Joy Fowler. I'm here to lead you guys in worship, to lift high the name of Jesus Christ. Would you stand to your feet, whether you're joining us online or in this room, we want to welcome you and we want to welcome the presence of the Lord where two or three are gathered in his name. He is there. We want to make much of Jesus Christ this morning. So will you put your hands together and will you sing along? cross before me, the world behind, no turning back, raise the banner high, it's not for me, it's all for you, let the heaven shake and split the sky, let the people clap their hands and cry, it's not just shares the gospel. The bottom line is we're in need of a savior. Jesus paid the price. He paid it all. Let's receive him today. Let's acknowledge his goodness, his lordship today. It's not about us. It's about him because he is the one with whom we have to reckon. 
He paid it all. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Would you sing this hymn with me? I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Sing it out. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow.
Can all God's children say, amen. Thank you, Lord, for the goodness of your goodness of your grace and your mercy. We give you praise and honor and glory in this place. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you so much, worship team. Let's give them a hand. Thank you so much for your service this morning. Welcome. My name is Ellen Osley, and I am here bringing you the announcements, the latest and the greatest at Rehoboth. Um, if it is your first time here, we would love to see you at the welcome table right or yonder. Um, yonder, yep. Uh, we'd love to meet you, and if it's your first time online, we also welcome you. Um, please comment down yonder below your screen uh, so we can say hi to you as well. We want to. Um, now, we only have two announcements this morning, um, so we're going to keep it, uh, this, this part is brief, but Pastor Troy said I can monologue for as long as I want because I only have two announcements, right? Yeah, yeah, he loves it. He loves it. Okay. First announcement, Wednesdays are back. Um, it is an awesome midweek refresher in a time of fellowship in a more casual setting. Rehoboth kids learn more about Jesus, play games, make crafts, there's stuff for them. New and exciting, new is bolded on my new and exciting things happening for the students. So um, you can find out more about that. Pastor Troy is teaching a Bible study about real life experiences. That is all on Wednesdays. So come on Wednesdays. And then next Sunday is a big day. That's August 27th. Mark your calendars. Make sure you're here. Next Sunday, we have the Lord's Supper and baptism. And if you want to be baptized, if you, if you would like that to be you next Sunday, email, email pastorsoffice at rehoboth.org, and we will reach out to you about that. And then, following the service, there is a church family meal. I have your attention now, don't I? Yeah. <laughs> following the service in the fellowship hall, everyone is invited. Um, so that's next Sunday. Come for church, stay for the meal. It's going to be great. And finally, thank you so much for your faithful giving. You can give in person by mail or online at rehoboth.org slash give. Thank you. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. It's happening. I'm taking her mic. Hey, didn't she do a great job? Hey, it is so good to be with the Rehoboth family today. I, uh, I want to introduce our guest speaker, uh, Andreas Kostenberger, and his wife Marnie are with us. Andreas is going to be sharing from God's Word. They are both authors and teachers and trainers. They have been with us for our Parenting Matters weekend, and I'm telling you, it has been outstanding. Uh, those families who've been part of that equipping and training know it has been so biblically refreshing and very, very practical and uh, just grateful for y'all being with us. Y'all let them know you're glad that uh, they are here. <clears throat> so Dr. Kostenberger has taught at a handful of different seminaries. He has published over 60 books. In fact, several of their books, not just his, but she has also published, uh, Marnie has published a number of books as well. They're incredibly helpful. They are, several of them are over on our book table. One of them is called God's Design for Man and Woman. He's actually going to be preaching about that today in, uh, in our service. Um, <clears throat> They have both dedicated their lives not to simply studying God's Word, which all of us should, but being used to the Lord as resources in writing and publishing tremendously helpful works. Today only, their works that are on the table are half price of what they would normally be. And uh, they range from a book on uh, essential parenting matters to works like this, and you're going to want to stop by and check those out. And uh, we look forward to, Andreas, you opening God's Word and preaching uh, from God's Word with us today. I want to share with you from Psalm 119. If you want to turn to the very end of Psalm 119, we're going to read that last stanza. So Psalm 119 is very familiar in our church family as we work our way through portions of it every January during our emphasis on soul care. This morning as we read God's Word together and then pray, I want to draw your attention to Psalm 119 beginning with verse 169. 
Let my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. Let my plea come before you. Deliver me according to your word. My lips will pour forth praise, for you teach me your statutes. My tongue will sing of your word, for all your commandments are right. Let your hand be ready to help me, for I have chosen your precepts. I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. Let my soul live and praise you. Let your rules help me. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. As we pray this morning, I I encourage you to remember especially uh, what continues to happen in Ukraine and uh, Russia. We have brothers and sisters in Christ across both those countries, Uh, in particular Odessa in the last several days, uh, a beautiful port city, really the crown jewel of all of the Black Sea, Um, uh, Russian missiles and other Uh, weapons of war have destroyed churches and theaters and electrical and water infrastructure, um, all things that you and I would normally think are out of bounds in even the most heinous wars. And uh, it it is just heartbreaking to watch what is taking place. So let us pray before the Lord today. Thank you, Father, for the word your word. And Lord, we confess to you that too often we open or scroll to simply find a a verse that might inspire or motivate. And Lord, I pray even as we open your word today and we seek to listen that we're not looking simply for rules or instructions, but that God, we would seek you And that our heart and our ears and our mind would be open and hear your voice from your word. Father, thank you that you have created us not only with a desire but even a capacity that we would be one with you and commune with you. Thank you, God, that you didn't leave us in our rebellion and our sin, but that through Jesus Christ, you've redeemed us and made us alive that we might be your children. Father, today our hearts are heavy, especially for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine and Russia and truly for all the population of both countries. Father, we cry out to you for justice. We plead with you for mercy. Father, I pray that leaders from around the world who have places of influence and authority that they would bring a righteous end to these things. Father, we pray especially for your children and our brothers and sisters that in these hard days, they wouldn't give up hope that even as they have gathered already today to worship you, that they would be renewed by your word. They would rejoice in the fellowship of the saints together and that even from their testimony we would be compelled to be even more faithful as we gather with one another. Father, again, we thank you that you have not left us in the dark and without guide. Thank you that you have given us your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Every 
Every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus sound of my voice right now there are brothers and sisters right now who are crying out to you who need you Lord and we just want to come together in this place and declare that you are God that you are the healer you are the powerful one you are the one who is able to break the strongholds that bind us and keep us in a broken-hearted state. Lord, you came to bind the broken-hearted. 
my brothers and sisters, if you're in this place right now and you're crying out to the Lord, would you just speak that name? Would you come to the altar? Would you come to the altar and pray right now? Pray for that person in your family. We're going to speak Jesus over our family. Maybe there's a name of somebody you want to pray right now. God knows. He has not forgotten. He sees and he heals. Would you just come down and pray right now? Would you lift that person up to the Lord Jesus Christ as we pray together as a body? Lord, you are the healer. You are the Jehovah Jireh, the provider. Lord, and we want to come to you in this moment and lift up our loved ones, lift up those ailments that are plaguing our families. Lord, we want to come to you and lay it down at this altar right now and ask that you take control because only you can heal. Well, good morning. 
Great to be with you today. Isn't it encouraging that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is now at work in you and in me and in our families? Uh, Marnie, I have really enjoyed getting to know many of you the last couple of days, and it's my joy and privilege this morning to proclaim God's word to you on the topic of God's design for a man and woman. I know this is not the first time, it probably won't be the last time you'll be hearing on this topic. It is a, it's very uh, close to the core of our identity of who we are in Christ. Yeah, but first let me say how grateful I am for the work that God has been doing at your church. It's been so encouraging to enjoy the hospitality of your pastor and his wife and, and your church and to, to see evidence of, of God's work. He's so faithful. Uh, Marnell will pray that God will continue to work in and through you in, in uh, your surrounding culture here. We're standing for God and, and for his word, standing for God's design for a man and woman. Uh, I know is increasingly countercultural. But uh, before I turn to my topic for this morning, I'd like to first, for those of you who couldn't join us, share with you very quickly some of the highlights, if I may, of our parenting conference, Parenting Matters. Uh, Marnie and I believe that successful parenting needs to be realistic, relational, and responsible. We call that 3R parenting, not reading, writing, and arithmetic, but realistic, relational, and responsible parenting. Let me tell you what we mean by each of this, these terms. Uh, first, we believe that as parents, we need to be realistic about at least three things. First, we need to be realistic about our own sinfulness and limitations as parents. You know, parenting doesn't start with the children. It starts with the parents. And often a parenting problem comes down not to the children, you know, like fixing our children, but to the parents. We're too busy. We may be too selfish. We can't agree on how to parent our children, or we're in some sort of maintenance mode without clear direction or end goal in our parenting. So what we tried to do at our uh, Parenting Matters uh, get-together was to, to cast a vision of biblical parenting based on, on God's Word. Uh, second, we need to be realistic about our children's sinfulness and need for inner transformation. Their need for inner transformation because our children are born sinners. They can't consistently obey apart from that inner transformation that comes from the new spiritual birth they experience when they trust Christ for salvation. So external rules will only go so far. So as parents, we need to make every effort to introduce our children to Christ, to look for opportunities uh, to do that. One of the greatest privileges that we had in parenting our four children to introduce them to Christ. Uh, and third, we need to be realistic about real life challenges in the world in which we live. We should expect to struggle as parents because the world in which we live is not always our ally when it comes to raising our children to become godly, mature Christian adults. Uh, we all know what a terrible shape our culture is in. Uh, so that was the first area of parenting we talked about, uh, parenting that is realistic about our own sin and limitations, about our children's sinfulness and need for inner transformation, and about the real-life challenges we face in the world today. And then second, we talked about relational parenting, parenting as a growing relationship with each of our children. And here, even though we, when we think about parenting, we think about essentially the parent-child relationship. We talked about five different kinds of relationships that we encounter in our parenting journey. First, parents with God, then parents with each other, then uh, parents with children, then children with God, and children with each other. Let me elaborate very briefly. It's very important that we don't neglect our relationship with the Lord. Um, and those of us who've been parents for a while, we know that, you know, things get very busy sometimes and it's easier to do, to, um, to just feel like we don't have time to pray, we don't have time to read uh, God's Word. So as parents, it is, it is our lifeline to spend time with God in the Word and in prayer, both individually and also together, which is an extremely vital foundation for us as parents. Even now, uh, as empty nesters, we, 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 uh, Barney and I... Uh, 
devote the first hour of our day uh, to the Lord, and we spend time in His Word. We spend, spend time praying, especially praying for our children, our families, uh, our family, and praying for our upcoming day. Um, and then we need to spend time with each other and not neglect our marriage, which is sometimes easier than said and done because our children place a lot of demands on us and, and keep us very busy. Uh, now, in terms of the parent-child relationship, we talked about how as parents, we need to be both instruct and discipline our children. It's not just negative. It's not just punishment. It's, a lot of it is actually positive instructions. We looked at Deuteronomy chapter 6, which talks about how we ought to talk about the Lord wherever we go. Um, and the fact that, you know, I love going on errands with, with, with my children. And just as we, as we take care of a few, uh, you know, little items of business, we have time to, to talk and, and to have some heart-to-heart -heart conversations. We talked about major parenting challenges like social media uh, and smartphones. Talked about, you know, teenage children uh, starting to drive, and cars, uh, relationship issues, and so forth. Talked about making it a priority to introduce our children to, to Christ, like I already mentioned, uh, so they, uh, we can enlist the Holy Spirit as our ally to transform our children's hearts uh, from within. Uh, finally, we talked about issues like sibling rivalry, resolving conflict when it arises in our family. Sometimes I felt uh, ill-equipped uh, when I first started out as a, out as a parent, so I, I had to uh, learn on the job. Uh, so much for realistic and relational parenting. And then our third and final emphasis was on, on being responsible parenting. And what I mean by that is that we're there for our children. We care for them all the way uh, from beginning even through the high school and even the college years. Uh, as they grow older, they still need us. And we shouldn't prematurely, you know, just uh, think our parenting is done and, and basically leave the parenting to others, such as teachers and coaches or, or, or their peers. Uh, we're still the parents, and we have a responsibility to, to be there for them and uh, to, to, go, to walk with them, uh, you know, as they face different challenges uh, in their own lives. Uh, so in, in our session on responsible parenting, we covered the following three areas. Uh, helping our children grow in character. That ought to be our first and major priority. Making wise decisions regarding their education. It's a really big issue um, in, in, in many of our families. Uh, you know, uh, once you have children who are school age, uh, uh, trying to discuss with your, your spouse, uh, what's the best school choice? And it's a personal decision uh, that depends on, on a variety of factors, schools in the area, finances, uh, you know, God's, God's will ultimately. Uh, but generally, we believe that, uh, like it says in the Gospel of John and all the Gospels, Jesus first trained and equipped his followers so as parents, we have a responsibility to train and equip our children, and then when they're ready, we send them out. Um, and then thirdly, uh, we talked about preparing our children for their mission in life, which includes uh, assisting them in figuring out their vocation, uh, listening to them, observing them, looking at feedback they're getting from others, what are some of their strengths, what are some of their weaknesses, and advising them in pursuing a relationship with a potential uh, spouse. Uh, just generally helping them make wise decisions, uh, uh, having wisdom, discernment, uh, godly character, being committed to a life of of purity, 2 Timothy 2, 22, to pursue uh, Christian virtues along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So hopefully that gives you an idea uh, of what we talked about in our, our Parenting Matters sessions. And uh, if you were there, hopefully this was a helpful review. And as, as uh, Pastor Troy mentioned, if you're interested to know more, you can look at uh, the, uh, the parenting books that, that we used for our uh, Parenting Matters conference. Now, as you know, our culture is in a great deal of ferment today when it comes to our topic for today, to male-female roles and identity. Um, in our cultural climate, often we're the bad guys because we stand in the way of people's free self-expression. And I recently read a book by a guy named Carl Truman uh, called The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, uh, which it's just eye-opening uh, to understand how now 
self-expression is the highest virtue, and people like us who say there's biblical parameters and boundaries for uh, our uh, expression, especially when it comes to our sexual identity, uh, we are uh, put on the defensive. And uh, so, in this cultural climate, we're told it's no longer appropriate to raise boys to be boys and girls to be girls. Uh, instead, we're supposed to treat gender norms as, as fluid, and anyone who teaches distinct binary gender roles, uh, male and female, is accused of oppressing people's free uh, self-expression. Now, I hope that you'll agree that at this cultural moment, we must be clear about what it means to be a man or woman according to God's design, according to Scripture. We must be faithful to live out that message in a world that's increasingly out of step with what the Bible teaches. And as I mentioned, uh, short of a revival, uh, living out God's plan for marriage and family is deeply, deeply countercultural. Uh, my wife and I founded a ministry, Biblical Foundations, and that's our website, biblicalfoundations.org, uh, about 15 years ago. And even already then, uh, we firmly believed that, that only a return to what Scripture teaches, especially in the areas of, of male and female uh, identity and, and roles, uh, nothing else will uh, turn things around uh, and... and, and uh, and pivot from the, from the free fall and from the moral uh, decline that our culture is in. And as I mentioned, fortunately, God has not left us without guidance how we are to live out our manhood and womanhood in His Word. He's given us His Word, and the Bible uh, contains very clear instruction of what it means to be man or woman according to God's design. Uh, that book, uh, God's Designed for Man and Woman, actually grew out of a class that Marty and I were teaching jointly. And what we found is that uh, when we share with our students and our children the consistent pattern of biblical manhood and womanhood throughout Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, uh, they find the teaching of Scripture time and again attractive and and life-giving. They, they realize that what we're dealing uh, with here, it's not a matter of polemics. It's not just a matter of a few isolated texts that can be interpreted in a number of different ways, but, but there is a consistent, coherent uh, vision and design that, that makes sense, and that resonates uh, with their own experience. Uh, I believe that anyone who cares to search the Scriptures in their entirety, we'll discover a biblical theology of manhood and womanhood that is wise, that's beautiful, that's good, and that's true. That's right. And we believe that God will bless those who try to live by this design, by this blueprint, uh, while those who reject or ignore God's Word will sadly have to pay, and are already paying, the, the, the negative consequences for their actions. But it's not because God has not left us uh, you know, has left us without guidance. So, what is this divine design for man and woman? This morning, I'd like to give you a brief overview of the biblical teaching on manhood and womanhood. Uh, and I know you've heard sermons on this before. You're going to hear some more. Uh, but what I'm going to try to do is, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to present that design uh, in, in four movements, the four movements of Scripture. Uh, creation, the fall, redemption, and consummation or new creation. And my hope is that as we look at these four movements, if you will, in the, in the, the, the grand meta-narrative of Scripture, uh, we'll see that God's design for man and woman is revealed at creation, but corrupted at the fall, that it is restored, it's being restored in Christ, and it will be completed in heaven where we'll be forever united with Him. So revealed at creation, uh, corrupted at the fall, restored in Christ, and consummated or completed in the new creation. And it's my hope that not only will you agree with this presentation, but that you'll also be equipped to share God's plan for man and woman uh, with others, that, that especially those of you who are parents can equip and saturate your children with biblical truth um, so that when they encounter challenges 
You know, when your son, like my son, is looking at a college application form, and it gives him multiple choices of gender, and he looks around and says, male dad, right? They will know not just which box to check, but they will be secure in who they are as a young man or as a young woman. Um, And that in addition to being secure in our own uh, male or female identity, we can bear witness in our culture to God's good, wise, and beautiful design. We can be a blessing and a source of wisdom for for those who are confused or who need guidance and are open to guidance. So first, creation. Uh, Let's pick up the story in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, which reads, uh, Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, so their man is used generically, and let them, in the plural, have dominion over all the earth. And then uh, verse 27, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. And those are distinct terms. This is not just some sort of a a range of identities. Uh, Say more about that in a moment. And then verse 28, and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. And verse 31, and God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. It was very good. So we see a few things here. We see that God made humanity male and female, not gender fluid or transgender. He created them to be fruitful and multiply, something same-sex couples cannot be or do. He made the man and the woman in his image, that is, in his family likeness, um, and he put them jointly in charge of this earth to take care of it for him as a sacred stewardship and responsibility. So Genesis 1 talks about God's creation of humanity in general, male and female, and then in Genesis 2, we get a close-up view, we get a zoom lens of God's creation of the man and the woman individually. Let's take a quick look at that creation account starting in Genesis 2, verse 7, where it says, The Lord God formed a man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And there's a wordplay involved because man in the Hebrew is is Adam. You know, we transliterate it in English into Adam. Uh, uh, And the ground means Adama. And so uh, Adam literally means earthling. You know, because he was taken from the ground. And in verse 15, it says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. Uh, In verse 18, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. So for a very brief time, Adam was single. (laughs) Not for long. And I will make him a helper fit for him. Uh, Verse 21, So the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And then the man said, this at last, remember he named all the animals, no companion found among them. This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So just like the man is called after the ground from which he is taken, the woman is called after the man from whom she is taken, because both in the Hebrew and in the English, there's this uh, linguistic connection uh, between uh, man and woman, or in the Hebrew, it's ish and isha. Uh, And then uh, Moses adds in verse 24, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So here we see that first God creates the man from the ground and the woman both from the man and for the man. And incidentally, uh, we uh, had a a very, I think, fruitful, helpful session uh, after lunch yesterday where we talked about the special words for maid in Genesis 1 and 2. God took great care to, to make to, to form the man out of the ground and then to fashion the woman out of the man. So, so God is the creator and the giver of, of our physical as well as our spiritual uh, being. And, and our body and our spirit, uh, they're linked together. We can't separate uh, birth, sex, or biological uh, you know, and, and physical existence and our spiritual identity. Uh, we also notice that the woman is identified as, as, as a helper fit 
for the man. It's a perfect fit, right? Uh, in, in, the, uh, in the original, again, it's the idea of, of the woman being a, the female counterpart to the man. And the word helper, of course, you've heard it before, I'm sure, is, is a very dignified expression, which is used uh, even for God multiple times in the Psalms. Like, for example, in, in Psalm 121, it says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? Who's my helper? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. So clearly, the woman's role in relation to the man is is very dignified. It's one of strong support and companionship and partnership. It says, you know, it's not good for the man to be alone. And then uh, God creates uh, the woman for the man and the woman to partner in uh, being fruitful and in filling the earth and and exercising dominion over it for God. So, uh, the way Marnie and I summarize God's design for man and woman in our book is essentially in our teaching is male leadership and female partnership. And they're both wonderful God-given roles and responsibilities. And we also have seen, I think, in Genesis 1 and 2 that in God's plan, birth, sex, and gender identity are wedded together and male-female distinctions are fixed and distinct. They're not uh, fluid or open to subjective uh, re negotiation, uh, you know, remaking, or, you know, we are essentially given the gift of being male or female. Like, we might be given a Christmas present, and we are to gratefully and excitedly open that gift. And that is not to minimize in this fallen world real struggles that those who are confused about their gender identity or who experience some other kind of gender dysphoria are facing. Obviously, uh, you know, we need to be willing to, to give counsel, uh, both biblical and, and if needed, uh, mental health or, or medical uh, uh, help as well. Uh, but uh, before we move on, let me talk to those of you who are single for just a moment. I, I do believe that God's original design was for people to be married, even though, as I mentioned, there was a very brief time uh, where Adam was, in fact, uh, single. Uh, in, in the Old Testament, there were very few people who were uh, permanently single, uh, though there were you know, people, widows especially, uh, who lost their spouse and, and uh, others were divorced. Uh, but then in the New Testament, we see a new development where both Jesus and Paul speak of a gift of singleness or a gift of celibacy uh, for the sake of God's kingdom. I'm referring to Matthew 19 for Jesus and, and 1 Corinthians 7 uh, for Paul. They both use very similar language. And the, the, the Greek word, the original word is charisma. You know, we get the word charismatic. It's the same word that is used for other spiritual gifts. So some... Uh, may have a gift of remaining unmarried so they can devote themselves fully to kingdom work uh, without the kinds of distractions and constraints that come when you're married and have a family. I, my, my college roommate, uh, Andy Smith, has been a missionary to the Philippines now for probably going on, on 30 years, and you know, we've had him over to our home. He is He's had an incredible ministry over in the Philippines in Southeast Asia, and, and he was free not being married and, 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 and being uh, content in his um, state, uh, befriending people, you know, through basketball ministry, or, or you know, he's a godfather of many of the, uh, the boys over there and, and has really bonded with people. And I think to some extent it is because uh, he is unmarried and, and God has called him to that state. But having said that, I think marriage is still the general pattern now, though as Jesus taught, there will be not, no marriage in heaven. So I'd say if you're single, much of what I'm saying today still applies to you because it relates to your identity as man or woman, not just as husband and, and wife. Um, and that's, that's the same whether we're single or married. And and who knows, uh, you know, you may marry someday, maybe even soon. Uh, in our case, Marnie and I have two uh, married daughters, uh, and we have two, as of yet, uh, unmarried uh, sons who are both in their 20s. And we, we pray for our sons to find godly wives and, and are trying to help them prepare for marriage. As a matter of fact, we're actively trying to locate suitable 
Uh, no, <laughs> I'm sure for our sons, no. But seriously, we are talking to them about God's design, uh, especially as men, so they can be ready, you know, for their future spouse if and when uh, God leads them into marriage. And of course, uh, in our own imperfect way, we try to set an example for them in terms of the kind of marriage we have and the way Marty and I relate to each other. So, um, so much for creation. Let's uh, move on in the story of Scripture, the fall. Uh, the Bible tells us that uh, the man's and the woman's marital bliss, you know, honeymoon, uninterrupted by sin, didn't last very long. One day, and, and you know the story, uh, Satan, the tempter, approached the woman um, and lured her into sin. Uh, in Genesis uh, chapter 3, we read, starting in verse 1, Now the serpent was, was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? So he's uh, challenging the veracity of God's word. And, and then a conversation ensues uh, between uh, Satan and the woman, comment more on that later in verse 4, but the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. So he's flatly contradicting God's word. For God knows, so now he's impugning God's motives, that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So God is, is withholding something that is good uh, from you that he doesn't want you to have. Isn't that still often the appeal today? Uh, you're missing out. You know, you, you want to be free. You want to be uh, independent. Uh, and then verse 6, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And then, you know the story, the man and the woman, they hide from God, but, but God holds them accountable, and he goes to the man first. He's holding him primarily responsible, even though the woman was the one who took the lead at the fall. Verse 11, God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman you gave to be with me. The woman you gave to be with me. She gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. It's like I practically had no choice. If you can believe the by here, right? Uh, the man doesn't even just blame the woman. When you read closely, he's actually indirectly blaming God, you know, who gave him the woman. Uh, you know, why God should have given him a better helper, right? So it's basically God's fault. Uh, and in verse 13, the Lord uh, then asked the woman, what is this you've done? And the woman said, here's the serpent. He deceived me and I ate. It's the same thing. I practically had no choice. I mean, this sounds like straight from a, a day in our, in our family, right, parenting our children. He's like, it's his fault. Um, well, Eve did have a choice, right? Uh, whatever happened to accepting responsibility for your actions? And, and as a good parent, right, God tells them the consequences uh, for their sin. God is a great example of, of appropriate discipline. Uh, verse 16, to the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband. And uh, there's different ways uh, people interpret that phrase, but I think most likely it means your desire shall be to control your husband because uh, there's a very similar phrase used in the very next chapter in Genesis chapter 4, verse 7, where it says sin desires uh, Cain, you know, but he must master it or control it. And again, the idea is sin desires to overpower, to control uh, Cain. And so here there's this uh, struggle for control introduced into the marriage uh, because of the fall, and he shall rule over you. So the fall affects the woman primarily in her relationships with her husband and children in the relationship sphere. Uh, and in verse 17, and God said to Adam, because you listened to your wife's voice and ate from the tree about which I commanded you. He's reminding him, right? We had that conversation uh, yesterday. We talked about the idea of, of having clear expectations. 
right? And then following through. So people can say, oh, children can say, I didn't know, you know, I was expected to obey. No, it says, Adam, you did what I told you not to do. Do not eat from it. And the verse 19, you will eat bread by the sweat of your brow. So the fall affects the man primarily in his work. Remember, he was originally put in the garden to work and to provide for his family. You could, you, you could say both the, the woman and the man will have labor pains, right? Um, after the fall, it's every person for him or herself. Everyone is blaming someone else. The man blames the woman and God. The woman blames the serpent. And there's plenty of blame to go around, you know. And it's like uh, I've tried to analyze the scenario at the fall, you know, for, for hours just trying to think through, you know, what happened there. Uh, the woman probably shouldn't have engaged in lengthy conversation with the devil, don't you think? That was probably not a very good idea. Or at least she should have checked with her husband. Uh, and he was either not around. You know, it's a little bit unclear there. He's only mentioned in verse, I think, 7. It says the man with her. Does that mean he just stood there the whole time and did nothing and said nothing? Or did he maybe just arrive at the scene at that point? It's hard to be certain. But, but either way, uh, the woman actually acted as the leader and... And the man followed her somewhat sheepishly into sin. Uh, regardless of exactly how you assign the blame, and like I said, there's plenty of blame to go around, uh, the devil turned the male-female relationship upside down. You know, you, you see a total reversal of God's order uh, from creation. And both the woman and the man took the bait. No longer was the man the leader and the woman his loving, corresponding counterpart. And they were a team. They were together. Uh, the woman was now the leader. The man had become a follower. And Satan succeeded in dividing them and in, in basically uh, driving a wedge in their relationship. Uh, notice what it says in verse 17. And God said to Adam, because you listened to your wife's voice. That's as close as we come to God's analysis of what happened, right? Uh, Adam should not have listened and ate from the tree about which I commanded you don't eat from it. So God uh, chastises the man because he failed to exercise his proper leadership role. And with my children, you know, especially my youngest, he's got all those great questions. With Dad, what would have happened if Adam had taken the apple or whatever fruit Eve gave him and had said, what am I doing? I'm not supposed to eat that. Would God have started over, made a new Eve? I have no idea, okay? Those are the kinds of questions that your precocious children ask you just to, uh, to keep you humble and realize that, you know, even if you're a Bible teacher, you still don't have all the answers. But uh, so the results of the fall were disastrous. Uh, God's image in humanity, his order for creation, his family likeness was, was disrupted. Um, you know, the, the, the male-female relationship, which had been one of harmony and unity and intimacy, had now become a, a constant, you know, tug of war and struggle for control. I think all of us who, who are married uh, know from a certain amount of experience that there's often this sinful struggle for control that, that breaks up and, 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 and threatens to destroy the intimacy, the intimacy that, that God intended for us to uh, enjoy uh, in marriage. And you know, nobody, very few people, maybe nobody that I know, uh, when they get married, plans to have a divorce. You know, everybody has the best of intentions. But something happens, right? And often it is that, that, that sinful nature takes over. And that is why, uh, in a moment, we are going to celebrate how redemption in Christ is restoring us to uh, God's original plan for uh, man and woman. Uh, but just when you look at the rest of the Old Testament, which is basically Genesis 4 through Malachi, uh, I'm going to try to summarize that as far as the consequences of the fall is concerned in, in the rest of the Old Testament in, in maybe 90 seconds here. Uh, what we see is you see uh, things like polygamy. You know, just a few chapters later, men marrying multiple women. Also, many marriages are no longer lifelong, but end in divorce. Uh, Deuteronomy 24 talks about, you know, what would be uh, appropriate grounds in divorce. And, of course, marriage, uh, uh, Jesus comments on that, you know, when people ask him about that. And he reaffirms that in the beginning, the plan was 
for marriage to be lifelong and permanent. Uh, the marriage bond is often broken by adultery. And of course, all of us uh, eventually die. So uh, you have a kind of a downward spiral uh, when it comes to male-female relationship after that uh, design has been, has been disrupted. But at the same time, you see this hopeful uh, trajectory and thread in the Old Testament as well, even after the fall which shows you that God's original design continues to be the ideal and continues to be in effect, even though people often fall short. Uh, the Song of Solomon celebrates the beauty of God's plan in marriage. Uh, in Proverbs 31, we read about a godly woman who is a strong support to her husband, who lovingly cares for her family and her husband and children praise her. Uh, they're brave leaders, male leaders, national deliverers like Moses or Joshua. Uh, there are male and female prophets who tell people about the coming uh, Messiah. There are many inspiring female characters in the Old Testament, wives like Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, prophetesses uh, like Deborah, Holder, or Miriam, and other godly women like Abigail, Ruth, uh, or Esther, and many other significant women like Hannah, the mother of Samuel, who is a precursor of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Uh, Marty and I are just uh, reading through Hebrews now, and, and we got a good laugh out of the fact that in the faith chapter, in, in Hebrews chapter 11, right at the end, the preacher says, you know, I'm running out of time. You know, he gives a lot of attention to Abraham and to Moses, and then he's gradually getting shorter and shorter, and at the end, he just rattles off a few names, and then he just realizes that he's out of time. I hope that won't happen to me this morning, but, but the point is, we need to move on to the New Testament. We see that people in the Old Testament after the fall, falls short again and again as they try to live out God's plan apart from the new covenant promise of God's Spirit enabling them, you know, internally to live out God's plan. And godly individuals were waiting for the arrival of the Messiah, which brings me to my third point this morning, which is the, the restoration of God's design for man and woman in Christ. So the third movement uh, in God's design for man and woman is, is of course, the, the most important one is redemption. Uh, so we've seen God's design reveal the creation. We've witnessed the corruption of the male-female relationship at the fall. Uh, so let's think for a minute about what difference does redemption in Christ make? Now, how does it affect specifically our topic for this morning? How does it affect marriage and family? And I know there's a lot of wonderful benefits to, uh, of the cross. Uh, you know, reconciliation and, and regeneration and justification and sanctification and, and, and so forth. But, but how does the cross impact God's design for man and woman? And so, in short, my answer is that redemption in Christ is able to restore male-female harmony and unity and is enabling us as believers once again to live out God's good design once again. I'm just going to look at a couple passages here in uh, Colossians and Ephesians because the Apostle Paul uh, was the, the, the preeminent letter writer in the New Testament who wrote to Christians on how to live out their roles in marriage as those who are redeemed in Christ. And I think it's good to start with a shorter passage, which gives us kind of the, the signature. Uh, there's just one verse for wives and then one verse for husbands. And then Ephesians just gives you, fleshes it out in greater detail. So Colossians 3, 18 and 19 says, uh, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. All it says to wives. And then husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. So here we see that, Paul tells wives to submit to their husbands, similar to the way in which Genesis 2 tells us that God made the woman as a helper fit for the man. But then Paul immediately turns to husbands and tells them to love their wives. And you know, I hope you'll agree that it's a lot easier to, to submit to someone when you know they love you and they have their, your best interests at heart though I realize it, it can still at times be a challenge. And certainly, uh, you know, uh, none of us husbands love our wives perfectly as, uh, you know, as 
with, with a truly Christ-like love uh, all the time. Um, and then, like I mentioned, Ephesians uh, 5 gives more instructions. Uh, but before that, let me point out that uh, in the build-up to Ephesians 5, and the marriage passage starts in verse 21 or 22, uh, in verse 18, there's that familiar verse where it says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I think it's, it's not a coincidence that uh, that is a segue into Paul talking about marriage and then parenting as well. Because what he's presupposing here is that uh, the husband and the wife are going to be spirit-filled disciples. And that's the only way any of us can really fully, uh, you know, experience the restoration of God's design for marriage. Uh, if the, the, the husband and the wife both are disciples of Christ, followers of Christ, who are filled with the Spirit. Um, so verse 22, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Uh, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of a church, his body, and is himself its Savior. And as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. So let's stop for a minute there. Uh, and we'll see in a minute that the instructions to the husbands are at least double as long. Uh, but there's two important qualifications here. First, there's to submit to their husbands as to the Lord. Uh, and then it says here, they, in light of that, they should submit to their husbands in everything. So it's clear that submission has limits, such as when a woman is married to an abusive husband. Ultimately, her submission is to Jesus, and part of that submission is expressed in submitting to her husband. Uh, and then, like what I said in Genesis 2, again, they're both jointly charged with exercising dominion over the earth. So really, the overriding truth is not actually been submission, but it's really partnership and uh, companionship. Uh, but then, as I mentioned, notice what, what Paul uh, says to the husbands, which is a lot uh, longer, uh, because he knows we need it. Verse 25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, but we're members of his body. And then uh, Paul quotes uh, Genesis 2.24, which we've already read. So you see that he's just reaffirming uh, the restoration of God's original design here. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And the word, the two is not even theirs. So if anything, Paul just allows himself a tiny bit of freedom. He further emphasizes the idea of two becoming one. Just like in the church, you have Christ being the head, and we're his body, and so the two are becoming one. Uh, he says this mystery is profound, uh, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church, because you see the same uh, idea of two becoming one, spiritually speaking. And then verse 33, however, let each of you, Paul summary here, Love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. That's kind of like Colossians 3. So, women, if you think God has some hard things for you to do, consider what husbands are called to do. Uh, we are to love our wife by giving ourselves up for her so that we can be an aid to her sanctification. We're to nourish and cherish her and hold fast to her and be united to her as God intended uh, men to do and be in the first place. So, uh, to love our wives with the love of Christ. I'm biased, right, because I'm male, but I think it's probably even, even a harder challenge uh, uh, if we do that well, if we want to love our uh, wives well. Uh, so we see that redemption in Christ brings about a restoration, and this is a process, right? It's not instantaneous, but it's a, a part of our sanctification. Uh, marriage and parenting are primary tools for God in our sanctification. It brings about a restoration of God's original design, where the man is the loving leader and the woman is his devoted partner. And so it's kind of like we're like the new Adam and the new Eve, where, uh, you know, as part of God's new creation, the two are once again united in serving God together, and we team up to raise our children to love and serve God. And, and Marty uh, and I just last night talked a little bit more about the importance of being together 
in parenting and being united in, in our parenting philosophy and in, you know, our, our strategy in, in raising uh, children and glorify God. And so then finally, let me just say a word about the, uh, the consummation, the fourth movement or the completion of God's design for man and woman in the new creation. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute. Didn't Jesus say, well, yes, he did. He said in Matthew 22, verse 30, uh, that people will no longer marry in heaven, but will all be like the angels and will all be spiritually uh, united to Christ. Now, I've kind of evolved my understanding. I believe that I will still know Marnie in heaven. Again, this is my personal opinion here, okay? It's not directly spelled out in Scripture. And there's not going to be less than what we experience on marriage. Somehow, it's going to be even more, because heaven is always more, never less than what we experience on earth. But I admit it is a little hard, sitting where we are right now, to imagine exactly what heaven will be like and what the implications are for God's design for man and woman. I know that it's going to be a higher spiritual reality. Now, I stuck with Ephesians for the most part in, in the third movement in redemption. So uh, I'm going to go to that passage one last time uh, and go to the very beginning, what many consider the theme verse of Ephesians, which is Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Uh, and I think that is also relevant for marriage because you have some of the same terms like the Greek word for kephala or head used here and then again in the marriage passage. And there Paul speaks of God, uh, verse 9, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, meaning in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. And in chapter 2, he talks about Jews and Gentiles being united, the two becoming one in the church. And he talks in chapter 5 about the man and the woman being reunited, uh, the two becoming one uh, in a spiritual union. So, so God's plan ultimately is even bigger than marriage. It's bigger than the family. It's bigger than parenting. Uh, it's even bigger than the church. It's, it's God's kingdom where every thing will be united under Christ's supreme and ultimate authority. So it's very important that heaven will not be an egalitarian utopia, uh, devoid of, of all kinds of leadership. It will be a place where God reigns supreme. Um, and as we see in Ephesians, God's plan to unite all things in Christ also encompasses marriage. So I think the lesson I I draw from this is that marriage is not the ultimate focal point of human history. Christ is. So I don't want to overplay marriage in the family. Marriage is very important, but our focus should not be on marriage as an end in itself, but as a pathway to bring glory to God. So how we do that is we follow Christ in discipleship. It still takes two disciples. And then on serving him together as men and women who are committed to Christ's lordship and supreme authority. And as we serve him and as we submit to him, you know, both men and women will honor him and bring glory to him. And we will be blessed. So let me conclude with a very quick recap. We've seen that God at creation designed the male-female relationship with the man as the loving leader and the woman as his responsive partner. We've seen that the fall, the roles were reversed, and the woman was acting as the leader, and the man followed her into sin. So there was a struggle for control and a lack of harmony and unity and intimacy. But then we also saw that God's plan in Christ, we just looked at that, is to bring all things, including the marriage relationship, back together under Christ's headship and authority. And so as we're filled with the Spirit, Ephesians 5.18, and as we put on the full armor of God, Ephesians 6, we can live out our marriages and family relationships once again uh, in harmony and unity for the glory of God. So in this life, we will be able to exp experience God's ideal only imperfectly. But one day when history is consummated, we'll spend eternity with Him and with one another in perfect harmony. What a great day that will be. But in the meantime, <laughs> we're not there yet. Uh, this world is pretty messed up. And 
the fact is, you know, as, as I was reflecting on how do, we, how do I respond, how do, how do Marnie and I respond to the, uh, you know, transgender movement and, and the ferment in the culture, we won't be able to save our culture, ultimately, from sinking deeper and deeper, apart from a, a spiritual revival, into the moral morass it's already in. Uh, so, in the end, we need to focus on what we actually can control. Um, and I want to make one final thing crystal clear. Uh, God's design for ma man and woman doesn't save anyone, as important as it is. And I just talked to you about it for half an hour. Jesus Christ, crucified, buried, and risen, saves us. So if you don't know him this morning, please trust in him for salvation and the forgiveness of sins. But while God's design for man and woman is not the gospel, and believing in it is not required for salvation, I believe how God made us is foundational to who we are. It's at the core of our existence. So my challenge for each one of us, myself included, is let's follow God's design in our marriage and families, and let's equip our children with solid biblical truth about the way God created us. One of the best ways in which we can flesh out the gospel is by living out God's created order in our marriages and families. So may God bless you and your family as you live out his good design in a world that is in desperate need of Christ. All right, well, let's uh, spend a moment uh, praying together. Great God, we worship you today as our creator and as our redeemer. Uh, you're so worthy. And we are joyfully embracing and affirming your good and wise and true and beautiful design. And God, I do pray for those here and around us who are struggling in this area of gender identity. And God, I pray that you'd help us to have compassion and wisdom and grace to be a blessing. And God, we ask your spirit to do his part in, in inducing faith in Christ and in, in bringing us closer to your wonderful design that he created in the first place. And God, it will not be until we see each other in eternity that all of this will be realized in a new creation. And in the meantime, we pray that uh, you would let the body of Christ do its work, that as a, as a redeemed community, as, as the loving, uh, sacrificial, serving community, we would be able to, to encourage and support each other and to witness to you uh, and to Christ crucified, risen uh, to a world around us that even more than needing to be informed about God's good design for man and woman needs to know that Christ loves them and gave his life for them so that they can repent and believe and have eternal life. Pray that you would go with us and as we're sent on a mission and help us to be faithful in Christ's name. Amen. A thousand times I've failed Still your mercy remains Should I stumble again Still I'm caught in your grace, everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond all fame. My heart and my soul, I give you control. Consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise become my embrace to love you from the inside out. Above all else, 
my purpose remains the art of losing myself in bringing you praise everlasting your light will shine with all else fades never end your glory goes beyond all things my heart and my soul created us, he shaped your soul to worship him, to be one with him, to be united with him. Andreas, thank you for such a faithful word from God's word. We are indeed grateful. Masculinity, biblically represented, is a beautiful thing. Femininity, biblically represented is a beautiful thing. Marriage represented biblically is a beautiful thing. And when called and in walking in Christ, singleness is a beautiful thing. The Lord is faithful. If you have not given your gifts to the Lord today, there are baskets on the back walls. Have a great week. Join us on Wednesday night for the midweek ministries that are taking place.